Hello, everybody. Today we have Janet Harvey with us. She is the CEO, Director of Education at Invite Change. I often encourage everyone to get out, increase their circle. And I had come across Janet, I believe that I had seen a, a TED Talk by you. And it really touched me. And I wanted her to come on. This is all about confidence. Our target market is women physicians. And we lack so much confidence. We're great at what we do, but when it comes out to promoting ourselves or getting ourselves out there, a lot of us struggle. Hence, this is why we started the podcast this year, as far as the theme being confidence and communicating with confidence. Janet, it is my pleasure to have you here. I am honored with everything that you've done. Coming on, sharing with us your knowledge. Thank you. Well, it's a pleasure. I, I love it when people just find me. So thanks very much, Sharon, for reaching out. And I've done a lot of work in healthcare and work with a number of physician leaders. So to be able to contribute in this way is wonderful. Tell me how Invite Change got started or how you went down this path. <laughs> no, come on. This is great. I'd love to hear the background. You know, uh, so I spent uh, my early professional life uh, in more of a corporate setting. And uh, in the early 90s, I had the great privilege to do a huge large scale change initiative. And I kind of looked at my team and went, we don't we don't really have the right thing to do this with. 6,000 people were going to have to move from being customer service personnel to selling. Not only selling, they needed to learn how to do financial planning. I mean, I, months into this initiative, I had people who said to me, does the chairman know you're doing this initiative? Because it was so countercultural. Talk about confidence crisis. Phew, huge. Well, coaching was just beginning to emerge on the West Coast of the United States. And I knew some of those people that were in that early work. And I said, can you come do some brainstorming with me? Let's see what we can come up with. And at the end of the day, what we call today generative team coaching is what I did. And uh, I stuck around for another couple of years. We were very successful. Um, in fact, you could see commercials on television today for Charles Schwab and the roots of what those people are doing as financial planners goes all the way back to that project I did back in the early 90s. And I, you know, I decided to become an entrepreneur. I said to my boss after a couple of years of kind of getting everything fully implemented, I want to go see if I can do this again. <laughs> Will another company uh, take this on? Will they find it useful? And uh, that's what I did in 1996. And I've never looked back. I've worked as an organizational coach and consultant and leader development uh, provider uh, all these years. And in 2003, became a coaching educator. So um, I'm absolutely a convert in the value of the mindset so that every one of us is whole. Everything we need is already in us. We don't always know it or pay attention to listening interiorly, but it's always there. And if we can slow down, if we can allow ourselves to listen a little more internally, confidence grows exponentially. And this is the value of working with a coach. Those moments are, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, I forgot about that in myself. And to have the support and a champion to keep going and to implement that as we navigate our lives. I think about change in a corporation for you guys who are ladies who are not in corporate life. That's one of the biggest problems I think is change because you have so many different people from different backgrounds. They're used to what they're doing. And if you have a new initiative or really something like what you're describing, very completely different, it's hard to get people to change, but then to work together as a team to change it and to take the company to another level. Uh, it's me. I love the name invite change. Because it really is, it relates to what you're, what you do, and and really that's what the problem is. We know that companies have to change. Like I think of, let's like just give an example of BlackBerry. They didn't change, and look what happened. Or Kodak, right? They they were at the top of their game because change wasn't not that it wasn't allowed. They didn't. Nobody maybe. I don't. I don't know that nobody thought it was needed, but the important people didn't think it was needed, and hence look at the outcome. So I'm glad you're doing this work to move companies forward. Thank you so much. And I, I, I can I can I play with you a little bit on this? I, I want to. I've been thinking an awful lot about what are the belief systems that get in the way of people changing. Because I've heard since I was a little girl that change is hard, and I've never held it that way. 
I just finished a blog last week on this subject. And so why am I, why don't I have trouble with change? Like, why doesn't it seem, it seems easy to me. And I, and I don't have all the answers for you. But what I would say is that I think we work very hard to be great at our work. We want to excel. We want to do quality work. We want people to be well served, all of us, no matter what profession we're in, but especially for people in healthcare. And we become identified with the thing that we can make be predictable and repeatable. Unfortunately, what it does is it narrows what we can see, what we pay attention to. But the world is always changing. Think about the seasons. Think about sunrise, sunset, moonrise, moonset, right? Every day is a new day. We know our bodies are changing. Gosh, you know that better than I could ever articulate. And yet somehow we think we ought to stay static because that's tied to our expertise. But what I've found, particularly working with chief medical officers who are um, navigating teams of docs in all kinds of different settings, is that when they can soften the identity around a particular technique and bring some balance with the humanity of the what we would traditionally call the right brain or um, the yin function or I, I like to talk about behavior. So intuition, instinct, sensing, um, you know, kind of that, that you can feel it when something really wants to be changed. And that's the beginning that makes it easy. Now, where we get tripped up is we don't have certainty about the future, which is the reason why we don't look at change in the first place. So people who get really, really, really good at their expertise don't want to change because I don't have certainty that if on the other side of the change, I'll be equal or better off. And if I don't believe in that, my internal inference system says, "Mm -mm, not going there. So it's not that change is hard. It's that we have the uncertainty about the future. And so we stay where we are until it's unbearable and we have a tragedy or we have some big, huge breakdown. And then we take it personally. This is where low confidence comes from. Talking about confidence, what is your recommendation for women out there that are struggling with confidence? And just in general, because whether they want to start a new business, whether they want to change where they are right now and advance, what do you say to them? I'll have to personalize it because yes, please, I want to. That's why you're here. <laughs> but I think there might be some patterns in it. I know one of the really big mistakes I made early on was thinking too big. I had a lot of confidence about what I had just accomplished and where I could um, provide that to others. And the phone was ringing off the hook because people knew me uh, in the industry and in the region that I was working in. And I said yes to everything. Oy, what a mistake. <laughs> I was so busy that I started to see my quality slip because I just didn't have the bandwidth to do everything that my my soul and my heart could imagine was possible. So it is really useful to go slow to go fast and to take some time, first, of course, to envision, what do I want to contribute? Not so much what do I want, because this question is too big. But if we're wanting to build a practice or we're wanting to introduce a new process or we want to convene circles of people to have conversation because we want to share our expertise. To keep the container manageable, what feels like um, just right, the Goldilocks level of energy to be playing with. How do I prepare myself so that I don't have to be looking at my notes, but I can just relax and be me, right? Be natural in my conversation and get some success under our belts. Having a, you know, one or two or three opportunities to do something. In my case, it would have been um, contracts, engagements with companies where the companies gave me a glowing review. I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm now I'm on to something. I know what I did there that really worked. That's foundational. What's one thing to add? Another example of go slow to go fast. What's one thing to add in the next contract that I do? Who do I know out there that is not doing exactly what I'm doing, but they have a similar value system? Let me start to build that network of people. 
What are they working on? Where are they finding success? What might I have to share that would lift them up? What are they sharing with me that's lifting me up? We both are better because we've been in that network conversation. And then I've just multiplied that over the years. And so um, one of my things that I do, uh, a lot of people think I'm crazy about this, but I'm happy to talk to anybody. If somebody has overcome their inertia and their lack of confidence, to reach out to me on LinkedIn or Facebook, or they call me on the phone. I love people who call me on the phone. I miss that. Um, <laughs> of course, they can have 25 minutes of my time. You bet. Who are you? What makes you tick? What are you happy about? What are you inspired to go do? What are the things that get in your way? How can I lift you up? I have done that all my life, and it has paid me back in huge dividends because where I get stuck, somebody I've met has an answer, or at least has an opportunity to say to me, you've got this, go. So network's really important. Right sizing is really important. Go slow to go fast as you're starting. And I think the other thing that I'm terrible at this, but I'm getting better, <laughs> which is to lean into the people that have absolutely loved us and respect our work and ask them, this is the key, ask them to be our champions. Who do you know that you would introduce me to? Not who do you know that you tell about me? Who will you introduce me to? Because I know when somebody connects with me and it's resonant, we're going to do something together. That's really magical and wonderful. So it's about getting to the human connectedness and that's opening the opportunity. We can dream all we want, but if we're not in action to get in proximity to the people that we want to serve, we don't get the privilege to serve. So that's another important piece. Looking back, what are you most proud of in your career? Oh, wow. <laughs> All right. So I'm a good Midwestern girl. I was born in St. Louis, Missouri, and pride is practically on that list of things you should never do. Uh, but I think for me, uh, my greatest pride is that I have followed my heart. Uh, my mother gave me a chest when I was a little girl. And on the outside, it says to thine own self be true, which obviously goes way back in time. And uh, that has served me really well. And I take great pride that I have always been the authentic me. Um, you said you'd watch my TED talk on judgment. And, yeah. you know, I think uh, growing up with a birthmark on my face, I learned very early on about people being judgmental and exclusionary and being uncomfortable for whatever reason, not ever able to see me if I was at the same kind of energy as everybody else. So I learned, express yourself, <laughs> take up space. You've earned it by being born and being in a human body. And as I took up space with joy, uh, not with ambition, not so much with um, see me because I'm great, but I want to see you. Who are you? Let's be together. That that level of engaged humanity uh, has overcome any objection I've I've felt from other people. And I win them over because I'm not interested in them pitying me. Um, let's let's be humans together. Got it. If anybody wants to get a hold of you, how do they do that? What type of work do you do with individuals? <laughs> So I primarily work in um, companies uh, of all shapes and sizes with the executive leaders and their teams. Um, I, I'm, a, I'm a big systems thinker, and I very clearly see that we are in a sea change right now uh, in the way that systems are operating from individual contributor to much more team-oriented, collective-oriented work. And we aren't quite ready. We haven't all shifted our mindset yet to what does success look like in that environment. So I, I work with individuals in a, in a generative coaching way. I work with their teams in that same way around the principle of sovereignty. And my definition of that is accepting responsibility for an inner authority every one of us has to choose how we relate to our lives. And when we live this way, we have the best possibility to live in integrity with our values and therefore have agility. 
So those are some underlying principles in order to learn to be generative, to face the future that is getting more complex and more uncertain as the days go by. But we're never uncertain from the inside out. And of course, the coaching is also supported with learning programs, how to be a generative leader, how to adopt a coaching mindset, how to become a coach. I have lots of people who come to our education programs because they recognize life goes better from that mindset and skill set. And they aren't necessarily going to be a coach as a livelihood, although that's available. But they really want to transform the relationships in their lives by being more coach-like. And so those are the things I do. So if somebody wants to get a hold of you, your website, your email, how much do you want to divulge? <laughs> All of it is fine. So the company side, Invite Change, is Janet.Harvey at invitechange.com. And very shortly here, like 48 hours, I'll be launching uh, JanetMHarvey.com uh, because I've just released a second book, uh, From Tension to Transformation, A Leader's Guide to Generative Change. And uh, I have been speaking for years, but not as a, um, a livelihood right? So um, I'm going to start speaking two or three times a, a month uh, as, a, as a keynote speaker and um, bring some of the work from the book into webinars and seminars. So um, I set up a separate site for that. So Janet at JanetMHarvey.com is the other way to get a hold of me if you want to engage me as a speaker. Tell me about the book. Mm. Why? You know, Why did you write it? A, it's such a labor of love for me. Um, I got the greatest compliment from one of my colleagues in South Africa who said, you have the most amazing way of taking what's perceived as a negative and uplifting it to be regarded as a positive. <laughs> and of course, he was talking about tension. And I did that on purpose. It goes a little bit back to wh where we started here around change. You know, tension is one of those things that we think we need to get rid of. You know, this is a healthcare provider. And that's true to a degree. You know, here's a rubber band. Let's see if it, there we go. Here's a rubber band. If it's flat like this on the counter for a long time, it goes to dust. It just disintegrates. If it doesn't get a little bit of exercise, it doesn't hold its elasticity. If it gets too much exercise nonstop with no break, it breaks and it doesn't bind anymore. So there's something for us to learn about how to harness the power of tension. When it shows up, what is it telling us? The fact that tension is an experience we're having says something's changed in the environment. That might mean there's some change I want to make as a result. It may also mean that other people around me are feeling this. I wonder, we're starting empathy and compassion with that question. I wonder, fill in the blank. Now we bring ourselves together to be more um, proactively adaptive before the stretched rubber band breaks, or we're just so exhausted we leave it on the table and we don't pay attention to anything. Now I'm simplifying, of course, but the point is, is that tension can be healthy and it holds the seeds of that transformation that we want in our lives. I think of the woman in medicine, so many of us had burnt out, right? That tension got too much and we snapped, right? And then at that point, it almost forces you to change, but not in a good way. Like you're, what you were referring to is more preventative before they get to that breaking point. Exactly. That is so, I, I think in some ways you've just named one of the deeper passions for me, which is nobody has to suffer. That's a choice. Being a victim is a choice. Being a rescuer and being exhausted is a choice. Falling into persecutor is a choice because we're not paying attention to the small signals, what catches my attention and pulls me away and has me feeling off center. Hmm. Wow. I wonder what motivated that. How did I get distracted from my sense of groundedness and center and joy? If I can pay attention to that in my reflection practice, I can start to see, oh, you know what? I haven't spent any time with my girlfriends in two weeks no wonder I'm cranky, <laughs> right? Or, you know what? We've had company like crazy through this house in the last week. I'm craving some alone time. 
What do I need to negotiate in my life in order to make space for that? That's that accept responsibility for the inner authority that always knows what's best for us. When we're in tension, the first thing to do is to It gives us so much more time than it takes because we won't make decisions that are increasing the stretch of that rubber band and the adrenaline and the cortisol that comes with it and all of the ripple consequences of that preventative. And when we're doing it on an ongoing basis, it is how we have resilience in the face of the unexpected dramatic things that happen. I often hear women have, you know, it's from the time they get up in the morning, whether they have a family or not, getting the kids out, going to work, and then sitting, literally sitting in their car down the block or in the garage before they can actually get out of that car and change over to the home life then. Like they're running around from work still, even though they're out of physically out of work. You know, one of the things that I've done with a lot of docs, and then I started doing this uh, in the pandemic uh, during 2020 and forward, and I'm I'm amazed how many people haven't been exposed to it. So I'm going to offer it here. It's a simple technique called square breathing um, that came out of the Heart Math Institute, and I have all the leaders that I work with do this when they arrive at the office, before they open their email or pick up their phone to listen to voicemail to do this activity. Do it again before they go to lunch and do it before they leave the office, not when they get to the garage. So that they're they're marking the transitions from one state of their life to the next state of their life. And they're giving themselves a time to restore, that's the noon time. You can also do it in a meeting when you're feeling really stressed out, right? You could do it anywhere. But if you can get into a habit of this, you're basically telling your system, your nervous system, you're okay. So it's a four count, soft belly, um, normal breathing, and then a slow four count. I said I was from Mississippi. I'm Missouri. And so we say one Mississippi, two Mississippi to count, right? So... So up to four Mississippi on a long inhale and then imagining it's at the top of your head, hold it there for a four count. And then exhale to a four count, often the hardest things. Most people just want to push it all out. Like, nope, push it out like a regulator. One, two, three, four, and then empty. Hold it there for a four count and repeat that four times. It takes less than three minutes to do. And it will utterly transform the parasympathetic system. So now your receptors can see, oh, this is what's going on in my environment. And we learn how to make that shift happen. It's a muscle building exercise. Jenna, thank you so much for being here today. Lastly, your your website will be out when this airs. It's mm-hmm. Janet Harvey. You will, the book will be on there or on Amazon? Yeah. Where? Yeah. Okay. The book is on Amazon. Actually, both books are there. The first book I wrote in 2020 is called Invite Change, Lessons from 2020, The Year of No Return. And the second book, From Tension to Transformation, A Leader's Guide to Generative Change. And it will also be on the website, which is JanetMHarvey.com. Thank you so much today for today. Well, it's a joy. Thank you, Sharon.